Now, our activities at the World Peace Foundation here at Fletcher School at Tufts focus on research, education, and engagement with policy. Uh, we seek intellectual leadership for peace, and there is no better place to pursue such an agenda than, than here at the Fletcher School at Tufts. Now, the theme of our event uh, this evening was at the initiative of uh, students, members of the student body of the Fletcher School, specifically uh, Stacey Vasquez, who is a War College Fellow here at, uh, at Fletcher, and Faika Mahmoud, who is enrolled in the Master of Arts in Law and Diplomacy. Um, they identified the potential for social media to connect diverse Muslim and non-Muslim communities as an important and under-addressed question, and more generally, the issue of social media in, in, in the contemporary world. And we have two exceptionally well-qualified and well-positioned panelists with us today to speak to this issue. Farah Pandit is the first US special representative to Muslim communities, and as such, is responsible for executing the Secretary of State's vision for engagement with Muslims around the world. Um, she's the first holder of this position, um, Previously, she had a number of important positions in the Department of State, the National Security Council, and USAID. Uh, Riyad Minti has been the head of social, uh, social media at Al Jazeera in its Qatar head office since 2006, after a career as an entrepreneur in the mobile technology business, uh, providing uh, content to uh, 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 media providers around the world. During his time at Al Jazeera, he's won praise for his success in building up the presence of Al Jazeera English in social media, making it, for example, the world's, world's most retweeted news organization. And he's also been, uh, he's currently involved in, in the negotiations whereby Al Jazeera is at long last having a presence in the mainstream uh, US media. So the format we'll follow uh, this evening is I will ask, um, uh, Special Representative Pandit to speak first, and Riyad Minti then to make a few comments. And then we'll open it up for a, a, a broader uh, conversation, a few questions, um, ask them to, um, to respond, and then we will close with our toast for peace. And all in all, um, this will take, uh, I anticipate, slightly less than, than an hour. Um, so let me, uh, first of all, ask uh, Farah Pandit to... Well, thank you very much, Alex. And uh, it is a really uh, heartfelt um, expression of gratitude to the two students who uh, found a way to get me back. Uh, thank you very, very much. I can't tell you. I, I, I was telling you earlier, I feel either really great things in this room or really more fear-like things. I haven't studied for my exam. Can't figure out which one, which one it is. Um, but all in all, it's wonderful to be back at Tufts um, here at Fletcher. Uh, it's a very special place, and I am especially grateful to some of my classmates um, who are here. Uh, and uh, and it's, it's a nice, warm welcome. So thank you very, very much. Um, I want to just spend uh, the time that I have been given, uh, about 10 minutes or so, with you to tell you uh, what I do for a living and why the question that you put on the table in terms of social media is so important to not just the work that I do, but the way you look at the world today. Um, I I am, as you heard from the, the background, uh, the first ever in American history special representative to Muslims, Muslim community uh, for the United States Department of State. Uh, and it is a position that was created by Secretary Clinton two weeks after President Obama gave his historic speech in June of 2009. Um, we are, as a nation, trying to do more than we have ever done before to engage with Muslims around the world, Muslims in Muslim-majority countries and Muslims that live as minorities. And that is really important. One point six billion Muslims in the world, one-fourth of humanity. So we have to find a way to uh, build new ways of communication, uh, partnerships, dialogue, find areas, as the president says, of mutual interest and mutual respect. Um, so as we have unpacked that and have looked at ways in which we can do this, Every part of our government is engaged uh, in this vision that the president has. At the Department of State, we are working with our embassies around the world, and we have for decades been engaged in uh, soft power uh, tools. We are doing uh, educational uh, exchanges. We do all kinds of uh, um, initiatives that allow civil society to connect with our government. But this is very different. Uh, and it's different because Secretary Clinton asked me to do three things. One is I am only focused on civil society. 
So I do grassroots, people to people, all day, every day. Second, I'm focused on the generation under the age of 30. Why? Because most Muslims in the world are under 30. 62% of the 1.6 billion people in the world are under 30. And thirdly, um, I said this in the way I describe my job, it is a global mandate. A Muslim living in Sao Paulo is as important to me as a Muslim living in Surabaya, Indonesia and everywhere in between. And that reframing and the recalibration of the way in which we think about the world is really pivotal because the voices in social media are not driven by which region you are from. They're driven by the power and the expression of the idea that is put out there, whether it's 140 characters on Twitter, or it's a picture that went up on Instagram, or it is an idea that is percolating through a blog that existed somewhere. So we're, we're leveling the playing field. We're finding new ways that this, these digital natives can interface with each other and interface with our government. So you are seeing profound changes in the way we do our work. For me, I am, for those of you who are tweeting here tonight, at Farah underscore Pandith. Um, and when I do the work that I do around the world, and I've traveled to more than 80 countries around the world in the last three and a half years, um, I talk to young people, thousands and thousands upon thousands of young Muslims around the world, to hear what they have to say from the grassroots level and move their ideas forward using social media. What I see as my greatest strength as a part of the United States government is to be the convener, the facilitator, and the intellectual partner with the ideas that I hear on the ground. The most uh, compelling voices are not always the voices of the people that have the largest titles and the largest platforms, but they are the voices of people who are doing amazing things. The young blogger who talked to me in Bahrain, the young social entrepreneur in, in Sao Paulo, the incredible activist in Oslo, these ideas need to be moved forward. They need to be moved forward within the peer group that I'm talking about, but also so that our government can hear from non-traditional actors about things that are taking place so that we can find ways to work together. So uh, one of the things that has been really wonderful for me as I think about the challenges and the opportunities that exist in our planet today is to, to use social, um, social media to push back against narratives that exist. In this moment in time. It isn't just about the demographic of the young people who are digital natives that are out there, but it's also about what's happening in the world today. I was saying to uh, one of the students here at Fletcher earlier today that when I was walking uh, in as a first year student at Fletcher in 1993, Sam Huntington had just written The Clash of Civilizations. And that conversation was really robust, really powerful, and it existed all day, every day. The West versus Islam, us versus them. President Obama has said there is no us and them, there is just a we. And if we are gonna debunk the idea of an us and them, if we're gonna push back against Al Qaeda and its affiliates who would like you to believe that there is an us and a them, we have to get new narratives into the, into the, uh, into the sphere that we are seeing every day. So where, where are those new narratives coming from? They're coming from regular citizens who can talk about what it means to exist on the planet, from influencers of all kinds. So I'm meeting hip hop artists, and I'm meeting poets, and I'm meeting social entrepreneurs, and I'm meeting everybody in between to move their ideas, uh, to, to, the, to move their ideas forward and to create a new set of narratives that are, that are out there. Uh, I see movement that is taking place with this gen generation. I've been working on the issues uh, in a post 9-11 world when the most critical data point, I will tell you, despite the incredible diversity of Muslims around the world, obviously we understand how important it is not to put everybody in the same bucket, not to suggest all Muslims are doing one thing, but to understand uh, the diversity and the nuances. But the key thing that I have seen around the world, no matter where in the world I've been, is the issue of identity. So for these young digital natives, the questions that they are asking is, uh, are, how can I be modern and Muslim? What is the difference between culture and religion? They're pushing back against old understandings of who they are to ask new questions. And they're asking those questions online. 
We have to be able to build the, the conversation so that they're seeing a wide variety of answers and not just the answers of those people that have the lo loudest microphone. So it has been an incredible journey over the course of the last few years to see where we are as the American government trying to connect with Muslims around the world and using the social media as the as the uh, as the one of the tools that uh, that are in our, that's in our toolbox, um, and to see the profound changes even in the co short course in this job, three years, but in my um, span in government since 9-11, as I've watched how things have changed, I've seen more and more, and I'm really interested um, when we get into the conversation, there has been uh, more activism, more uh, interest in really getting your opinion out there than ever before, so that they are, young Muslims are not waiting for someone else to define who they are. They're saying, listen to me, we matter, our generation matters, and this isn't about just the Middle East or Africa or South America or Latin America. I mean, it, it is not a region. It's across the world they're saying that they deserve to be heard, they want to be heard, and their perspective makes a difference. What we're trying to do as U.S. government is to hear their perspective because that's where you find the places of common interest. So with that, I'm gonna, that's a very general uh, thing. We can get into the questions um, during the, that portion. Um, but the final thing I just wanna say is that um, as we are, we have known, I, we've met before, we've had really great conversations. And I think one of the things that, um, that I will say leading into you is that you are absolutely the example of what I meant by the generation of young people out there doing what it is they do. And, and, and I love the fact that you're here to talk about what it is that I'm seeing. Okay. No pressure with that. None. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, so thanks for that. Uh, it's interesting that you say that. And just by way of introduction, before I get into Al Jazeera, let me give you a bit of history of how I landed up at Al Jazeera. And I think it deals directly with what you said. I think I've told you the story before that uh, for myself as a young Muslim uh, guy coming out of high school, 9-11 happened when I was in high school, and there was a lot of misinformation about the Muslim world that was happening out there at that point in time, specifically from mainstream media and the way in which it was being portrayed. Um, interestingly enough, there was a study done by Wired magazine about two months ago where they studied the way in which mainstream media covered um, the, Muslim, the Muslim involvement in 9-11 comparing to lobbyist groups within the U.S., and they took press releases that were sent in the first few days after 9-11 and mashed that to mainstream media coverage. And there was a very big correlation between the actual press releases that were sent from lobbyist groups to what mainstream media were doing. And the other side of the conversation was not heard. It was completely absent. And for people like myself, sitting in South Africa, seeing this conversation unfold around me, I felt completely powerless. I felt like, you know what, this is not me. This is not the person that I am. This does not speak to my religion. My religion teaches me the complete opposite of what's happening here. And I, I just felt helpless at that point in time. Um, at that point, I was about to go into university, and I was trying to figure life out, what I wanted to study. Um, a lot of options from law to international relations to business. Um, I eventually settled on law. And I started out my first year at university um, with the intention of doing law, but I spent most of my time putting up posters um, organizing protests and trying to tell a counter narrative in terms of political engagement within campus. Um, so I spent very little time in lectures, uh, which didn't go too well for me. Um, but to a large extent, I also felt disillusioned with the educational system because I felt that the system that I was in also wasn't helping me tell my story because it still had so much legacy that was coming towards the issues that I wanted to deal with. So I dropped out of university. Um, and it's interesting that I'm at the university now and last month I was at Harvard Law School too talking about this. Um, but I dropped out of school and I started a technology company. Um, and the main reason behind that was because I felt that technology played such an important role in maybe helping tell my side of the story. So by being involved in content, by putting my message out there, by using digital platforms, I could engage with other people and I could tell them, listen, ask me anything you want. You know, I have nothing to hide. I'm not ashamed about it. I'm a practicing Muslim and I'm proud about that. But my ideals and my values are very much the same as you. I believe in democracy. I believe in freedom. I believe in freedom of expression. Let's have a conversation about that. Let's talk about it. And that's why I moved into um, the digital space. And that worked out well for me for a while. Um, didn't pay the bills as much as it needed to. Uh, but I think uh, as a young kid getting involved in this, um, it was an exciting time for me. And Al Jazeera entering the media market around about that time, I think the, the coverage of the war in Iraq was very pivotal at that point. And it was the only counter narrative to what mainstream media were doing. So we're um, looking at CNN or news organizations. They were embedded with US troops going in and showing that side of the story. They were showing where everything was taken off. 
all the rows on the other side showing where it was landing and what were the stories and what is the true impact of that on people on the ground. And that's something that spoke to me because having both sides of the story is critical. It's absolutely important to understanding and informing an audience. We shouldn't be there as media organizations telling you what to think. We should be giving you the facts and you need to make up your mind once you see that information. Um, so we were trying to get Ultra as a client uh, for a while. Uh, and I think in 2006, eventually they came around to the census and said, okay, this digital internet thing is gonna be important in the future. Uh, instead of contracting out to you, why don't you come and join us and help us figure this out. Let's see where the media is gonna be five, six years from now, what impact a digital platform is going to be and can you help us build this uh, to try and understand the analysis. So 2006, um, I think I was, what, I think 20 at the, uh, yeah, 21 at the time, uh, moved out to Doha as one of the first people to join the new media department at Al Jazeera. Initially, obviously focusing on mobile platforms because that was my background. Social media was something that we knew we needed to do um, because we saw things emerging at that point. You know, YouTube still wasn't really around. Twitter, Facebook didn't really exist at that point in time. You had other random networks, um, which MySpace, uh, Friendster, and Hi5, which I'm not sure how many of you would know about those. Um, but I mean, those are more about personal branding and not about a conversation. Um, and our philosophy within the new media department when we were trying to figure out what this should be like, um, we analyzed the media landscape at the time. And what we realized was media, and to a large extent media today, is still someone sitting in a chair talking at you. you know, and there's no conversation. And what's happening today, which is even worse, is people are presenting their opinions as fact. So people are sitting there saying, this is what I think is happening in this part of the world. And people are taking that as news. And that's very disturbing to me. Because you cannot take that as news because that's a person's opinion. And the role of media is to facilitate that conversation. Um, so the first phase of our strategy was looking at how can we start making our screens more interactive. Obviously, asking questions and taking input from the audience and putting that on screen. Um, but the ideal space where we wanted to move towards in the social space where Al Jazeera sits in the middle and we facilitate the conversation. where We become the source of news and information, not just Al Jazeera, but any other news network that's out there, able to put facts forward to the audience. And then you have communities on either side who are discussing it, engaging in a debate, in a discussion, in a conversation. Um, and social platforms is the space to go to for that. Um, I think our strategy and what we started working with, I think the Arab Spring is probably the, uh, what happened in Egypt is probably the best example of kind of everything coming together at, at that point in time. And I think one of the reasons we were so, we covered it so well was because we were prepared for it. We weren't reacting for it. We were listening to those voices on the street. So when things started happening in Tunisia, we started engaging with people in different countries. We started following people on Twitter and having an ear to the ground to understand what people were saying, what people were thinking. Um, and we were able to pull those conversations into mainstream and present it to the audience and facilitate that conversation. Um, so that's a bit of history about the Al Jazeera and how I landed up there. Um, to talk to the point about social media and the impact it plays, you know, I think about two years ago, social media had a lot more potential than it does today um, in order to facilitate this conversation. I think right now, um, there's a lot more noise that's out there. There's a lot more disinformation. And as these networks are growing, Facebook over a billion people, Twitter 200 million people that are on these networks, we find finding people are further polarizing themselves and only trying to identify with people who have similar opinions to them to a large extent, and that's what's happening on here. So while we've seen these, these uh, different movements emerging, we'll find the hip hop activists who are going on there are within the hip hop activists. You know, and to make the jump from that group into another sphere is not really happening, and the platforms in the way that they're designed right now are going in the complete opposite direction. So Facebook are helping you group people according to lists. They, uh, you, know, you don't see everything in your feed anymore, it's based around interests. So only if you post it around certain things, you're gonna get that specific information. Twitter, it depends who you follow. And if you don't like someone's opinion, you just unfollow them or you block them. So you're still grouping people around that. Google Plus, which is uh, Google's attempt, is also with the group feature allowing you to put people into groups. Now, the theory behind that would be you could then have different opinions into there. But what's happening is people are only following people who they agree with. And that's a challenge because you're not having those alternate voices jumping in. And social media is now becoming mainstream. And the, the, the worrying thing for me is that it's starting to follow the same model of broadcast media where it's still going to be people talking at each other, not to each other. And what happens when you have breaking news events now is if we put a story up on our Facebook page about something that happened in the world, instead of having a conversation around it, you'll have one side who believes one thing, the other side who believes the other, and they just start going at it and fighting and screaming at each other, and there's no conversation. Um, and that's the challenge that we have. And I think as these networks grow, 
it's an opportunity for people to come in and have it. And I think what the State Department, what you guys are trying to do is facilitate that conversation and go beyond the noise and put people into a conversation. Um, and I think for technology companies, for media organizations, um, it's, it's a space that needs to be developed into. There is a very big um, shift, and I think what I was telling uh, people I spoke to earlier is uh, I'm sure you've all heard the news about our purchase of current TV in the US um, and our expansion to the US market with Zero America. And we had a whole big communication plan around what sort of responses we would get back. And interestingly enough, um, tracking conversations on social media within the US to this announcement, about 46% of it was positive. You know, 48% were neutral people saying, you know what, we, the verdict's out, we will watch you and we'll make our mind up. And that to me is showing a big shift in terms of accepting the other or accepting something that's different in terms of a willingness to engage. So there is that movement that's happening there but you know, mainstream media organizations, and it's up to people to join that conversation and open up to it. Um, but I use the word conversation a lot, and I don't like talking at you. <laughs> so I'd like to hear what you have to say and take your questions and hopefully have a good conversation around that. Thank you. Thank you very much to you both. That was an excellent start to the conversation. I'm going to call on our, our, our two instigators of this event to, um, to, to kick us off with, with comments and questions, and then maybe if you can respond to those. Hi, Kerry, you going first. Hi, my name is Faika. Thank you uh, both for making the time to come here. Um, all of us really enjoyed your comments. Uh, they're really insightful. Uh, my question um, would actually focus on gender issues emerging from social media usage. Um, some trends were really interesting within the Middle East about how men and women utilize social media differently and how the way women or the way men perceive themselves is evolving with social media change. I was wondering if you guys had comments about that, and if you, uh, uh, Mr. Minty, if you had, in your work, observed uh, trends emerging. Sure, okay. Stacy, do you want to put yours, in the, and, and, and then I suggest you respond to these two. Yeah. Sure, thank you. I would like to echo our gratitude for joining us as well. Um, Fike and I joined in this conversation originally because I had been working with the War College Fellows and we had all been in conflict areas and we didn't understand the people that we were in conflict with and we desperately want to know them and understand where they're coming from. So we started to explore ways that we could have peaceful engagement with people and we wondered if there was a place for social media to help us do that. So I would like to hear some of the ways you're using social media to educate and inform people who have to function within these realms and need to know one another. Sure, um, two really great questions. And, and I, um, so I'll be very specific on the gender thing first and, and, and jump into the other thing. Um, look, I think that it, it's very, um, let me step back. When I started looking at how Muslims were responding to 9-11, I looked at it because I was at the White House and we kept hearing around the world as where, where are the Muslim voices? Why aren't they saying anything? Why aren't they saying Al-Qaeda is not part of Islam? Why aren't they doing more? When we look 10 years after this event um, about the, the numerous voices that are out there, the, the percolation of ideas that have, have moved forward, you're seeing a huge change, uh, at, thankfully, um, because there are, a lot, many, there are a, lot, a lot of different perspectives, there's a lot of movement, but you aren't seeing um, a kind of hierarchy of who the most important voices are, you're seeing it spread out. And I think that's very important. So changes have happened in the course of the last 10 years. So too has the conversation uh, changed with regard to how women are thinking about these issues. And I'm being very particular about 9-11 because um, that was a starting point for a lot of conversation. As Riyadh was saying, it's like, I wanna hear my, hear my voice. Don't listen to the headlines. I mean, this is a generation that grew up every single day since September 12th, 2001, with the word Islam or Muslim on the front page of a paper online and offline. This is a generation of people who have responded to a world event. So what have the women done? The women have been asking questions about, A, their role. And this is beyond the Middle East, and I know you asked the question about what, ha what was happening within the Middle East, but what I've heard from women all over the world is how, how uh, 
How many rights do we have in Islam? What are other women doing around the world? Can you tell us more about what's taking place? So it goes to the issues of identity, uh, their role in community, uh, how they can take action. Um, social media provides a more protective space, obviously, for them in, to, to have a conversation, but it's bringing new players to the table that they normally would not see. So there's definitely a specific gender thing. I say all of this with the caveat that, in my view, I'd be interested in yours, there hasn't been enough research out there in terms of what the data is really saying about the gender roles. I have been trying to gather that data through think tanks, through others, but there isn't compelling evidence to say, gosh, this is what women are doing who are Muslim and this is what men are doing. You're, it's just anecdotal pieces that come together. Um, on the issue of, uh, of how you use um, what you hear, uh, on the ground and what's taking place in the social media spaces. Are you asking from the perspective of education uh, with US government officials, or how are you asking that question? Just generally, generally in the population as well, because I think that there's a longing for other people to want to know Muslim people and understand where they're coming from so that we can engage with one another. So one of the things that's really uh, wonderful for me to see is the kind of people who are interested in the responses to what I see. So what I post on Facebook and what I post on Twitter, to watch who's retweeting them, where they're being retweeted, how it's being used. You talked about Wired Magazine a couple of months ago. They just did a profile on a, an initiative that we launched called Viral Peace, um, training young people to use social media to push back against extremism. It's in a really nascent program, but it's showing um, some positive responses. If we aren't able to go into a space and lift up the voices of what people are saying, and even in 140 characters on Twitter or me posting something on Facebook, to tell the story where stories can be told, the Cham in Cambodia, the young Somali immigrant in third generation in Norway, the person who is doing something in Uganda who is really tremendous and needs to be heard. We're sharing that with government officials all over the world because it's open spacing um, on social media, but also it's a leverage point for us to be able to say, go back and watch the thread of what's being take, taking place. We tweet all the time. We, we share the stories of regular people. So it is an exposure, it is an educational process, but there's also a more formal thing, and that's why I asked that question. I spend a lot of time uh, educating my own US government uh, colleagues through the Foreign Service Institute and others to teach them about where to go to hear uncommon voices. So it's a really important question you asked. OK. Um, in terms of trends of gender issues, you're right. There hasn't, the research just hasn't been done. Um, but what's interesting, and I think you touched on this, is the, the feeling of empowerment. And I think that's what's really motivating, specifically when looking at uh, females and women who are on social media. You're no longer just a lone voice. Um, and I like to use the term the power of a hashtag yes. um, because the hashtag is probably one of the most powerful things that exist in the world today. It allows you to move out of a conversation where you're just an individual into a collective conversation and you don't feel alone anymore. Um, take the woman driving in Saudi, for example, that people are able to have a voice now. You know, and collectively, as a block, you're able to go out. And someone at home might see a story or might see this trending on Twitter, say, hang on, I feel exactly the same as that person. They'll join into the conversation. And it's that power in numbers that are pushing people forward. Um, Egypt is a good example. I think Egypt, uh, one of the most critical things in the entire Egyptian revolution was a video posted by a young girl, Asma Mahfouz, um, who posted a video saying, this is our time. We want our freedom. We want our rights. Enough is enough. Um, and that went instantaneously viral. That led to people going out on January 25th, which led to January 29th and had this knock-on impact. Um, and what we're finding is this decentralization of, of the gatekeepers of information. Um, so looking within the Arab world or in society, um, due to cultural re uh, uh, reasons, not necessarily religious uh, reasons, you still have a very male-dominated society. And what you're finding is women are feeling empowered that, hang on, you don't speak for me anymore. And the culture that you bring in is not my religion. Um, and they're able to then have their voices out there and speak for themselves to show the world and themselves uh, exactly what it means to be a Muslim female living in this part of the world. Um, and those trends are starting to emerge and they start to come up. Um, the, one of the bigger challenges that we have, obviously, is language, um, which I didn't touch on earlier, but language is a very critical thing when going into here. Um, looking at the numbers across the Muslim world, not everyone is in, tweeting in English or, uh, and posting to the, to the Western world. Um, so how do you then get into the people who are tweeting in Arabic, whatever the native language may be, and understand their issues? Because often it might be different to those who are um, posting in English. 
uh, in terms of education and how it can be used to inform, at least from a, a media perspective. Um, there's an equation I like to use, and I started using this after uh, 2009 when the protest started in Iran. And what we noticed at that point was um, after the, the elections happened, there were a lot of people out on the streets were protesting and tweeting about it. Because the Iranian government shut down the internet, at one point we were only able to verify six people in Tehran who were tweeting about the issue. But there were 250,000 tweets that day using the tag hash Iran elections, majority of which were people from the outside talking about what is going in versus people on the inside. Um, so from a media perspective, the equation I like to use is information minus noise plus context equals accurate reporting. You know, and that, that to me is critical. And I think that taking social media 140 characters, it's easy to take things out of context, um, specifically when you're trying to understand people who are you know, thousands of kilometers away. Um, you need to do the verification. You need to understand it. And what really, really, really gets under my skin at this point is um, journalists in the US or any part of the world who will see what's happening in the Arab world and will see, OK, this account has 140,000 followers tweeted an opinion about something, and they'll retweet it. This is what's happening right now on the ground. You know, No, that's not what's happening on the ground. Just retweet. take your time, understand the issue, understand the person, take a variety of voices, and then, as a media organization, report on that. You know, Don't just report on what one person said on Twitter. And this is what's happening right now, looking specifically in Egypt and everywhere, there's this disinformation, or people aren't doing their homework. Um, and what really made it and highlighted it for me was um, when Hurricane Sandy hit, all of a sudden, because it hit close to home, Journalists in the U.S. started verifying and started doing things a lot more. When people were tweeting saying, this is what's happening right now, they're like, hang on, I need to verify that before I can report on it. But when it's a few thousand kilometers away, they'll just report on it immediately. You know? And so at, from a media perspective, we have a responsibility to do that education. And I think media organizations are failing in that part. And I think they're doing more harm than good by, by not doing their jobs. Thank you. Um, I, I should make an announcement, which is immediately after this discussion, we'll be having a, a toast, and the um, staff are already beginning to hand round the glasses of champagne. Um, so that's in, in anticipation of that. So I, let me take um, three questions in, in, in a batch. We have one at the front here, um, and, and then two. Thank you. My name is Imad Atala. Um, my, my question, uh, as, a, as a technology person and a social entrepreneur, I will uh, ask the question not to glorify technology or kind of push you in that direction, that the technology that is behind social media, uh, rather about policy, policy making from the point of view of government or uh, within your institution, uh, 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 policy that uses the technology, social media. Um, <clears throat> how much... Uh, of in your work, uh, do you see that uh, uh, the uh, uh, information that you gather uh, from the use through the use of uh, social uh, networks is actually influencing the fundamental underpinnings of policy making in the State Department, and whether that is being tr uh, trumped by the constraints of policy that's going in the other direction to influence? Uh, the region, or opinion making in the region. And the question to uh, Mr. Uh, Minty is, uh, you mentioned that uh, Al Jazeera has, uh, well, started as, or made its uh, uh, impact by presenting the other side, and which is very true. Uh, has the Al Jazeera made a 180 degree move to the other side where, uh, and I'll you know, take for example, using social media, we all have watched, for example, the documentary in English on uh, in, uh, social networks about Bahrain. Excellent documentary in my view. What happened after that? And uh, in terms of your policy toward Bahrain um, and the insurgency or the protests in Bahrain and compare that with what's happening in Syria and both, I don't know if, at least uh, Ms. Ms. Bandit mentioned Al-Qaeda um, um, or the fight against Al-Qaeda. Well, the, also the Qatari government who's sponsoring uh, Al Jazeera is involved heavily in, uh, with elements of Al-Qaeda in Syria. So I wonder uh, mm -hmm. about that and w how you uh, reconcile all that in your work uh, through social networks. Thank you. Thank you. We'll, um, we'll take another two questions, Mr. Blakely in the middle here, and then we had one right at the end. 
I'm Jerry Blake. I've been overseer of Fletcher for over 30 years. Ms. Pandit, I'd like to ask, if, of all the countries you visited, is Iran one of them? Now, I've understood from Christian Amanpour on CNN, who grew up in Iran, she said there's tremendous restiveness among the young people now, and they're very unappreciative of the clerics running the country. And the question, is that true? Is that the case? And thank you, thank you. Mr. Mitzi, uh, earlier in your original presentation, you alluded very quickly to the Arab Spring. Fascinating concept. And uh, a couple of questions. A, I, I'd like to know from you, because you're intimately involved with Al Jazeera and so on, is it a misnomer? Um, versus, for example, maybe late, um, late winter as opposed to Arab Spring. Uh, the other is, what is your prognosis? You're on the ground. You write a lot, obviously. You see a lot. You hear a lot. You tweet a lot, as I've just learned. Um, uh, what do you make of it? Is it going anywhere? Or is it going back to late winter or early winter, for that matter? I mean, uh, we know what it is, Tahrir Square. We identify with that. That was the Arab Spring, and then came uh, uh, Libya, now Syria, and so on and so forth. So where do you place it all, and where is it headed? Thank you. I, I should say on, 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 on the first day of the spring semester here at, at, at Tufts and Fletcher, we can see, um, and, and we will experience all, all the vagaries of winter and spring over the next couple of months. Uh, but please... Do you want to so one of the things I remember questions? about coming to things when I was a Fletcher student is that you never ask just one question. It's one question and then four more that come after. Shame on you. You're in big trouble. Um, okay, so a, a couple of things. One is, um, obviously, I mean, I mean, policy doesn't happen in a vacuum. Of course, what's happening in the real world matters to policymakers. Um, we gather information in a wide variety of ways. It's not just you're only looking at this or only looking that at that. One of the things that is absolutely remarkable to me as somebody who was a political appointee in the Bush administration and is a political appointee in the Obama administration, and I say that for a reason. Um, I've been at state with two different secretaries of state, and I have respect for both of them. But one of the things that Secretary Clinton has done, which is really important and powerful, and I, and I poked at it when I was talking earlier, is that citizen diplomacy is unbelievably important to this secretary. So is sec 21st century statecraft. So the way policy is being made by the Secretary of State for the United States of America is based on what people are thinking on the ground as well as other channels, more traditional channels that we, that we have. So all of our ambassadors are listening in new ways. Uh, all the different components of State Department are listening in new ways. When we come back from trips and we talk to the Secretary about what we've seen, it matters to her to hear that I heard this and this or this is trending uh, you know, in the conversations that I'm hearing online. Um, so nothing is in a vacuum, and of course it makes a difference, uh, and it influences. So that's the short answer to, to that. And I think it's important when we think about, for the students who are here from Fletcher, as you think about your careers going forward, what's going to be the next thing? What are the other influences and tools in your toolbox as you are policymakers and you think about where we look at things? And there was a time when you got your intel briefings and you got your, you know, what's happening in current affairs and you put them together and figured things are, uh, uh, that's not where we are right now in human history. Certainly not here in the United States. And I, and I feel really happy about that because it means that the young, amazing woman that I meet in Rabat or the guy that I meet in uh, Jakarta can make a difference to the way I understand something. And if he or she makes a difference to the way I understand something as a senior policy person at the Department of State, it means that the Secretary of State will hear it differently. So I think it's a really wonderful new sort of era that we have uh, embarked upon. Um, Sir, you asked a question about Iran and whether or not I have been. No, I have not. Um, there, there's me personally. Um, I have not gone to Iran. Um, I think that you're making a larger point uh, in terms of what's happening with youth in Iran, and I would echo that. I think that there was a question earlier that I, I, we didn't specifically focus on youth, and I really want to say that, that when you say that they want to be heard, you know, the hashtag that I use is why youth matter, because they do matter. And what they're saying must be heard, not just by us, but by all of you. So what's happening in Iran at the civil society level in terms of what youth are doing, it hits on the themes that I've talked about in terms of identity, 
about who they are and what they want for their future. Um, it, it also slices into this issue of religion and what it means to be Muslim on the planet in the 21st century. Um, it has re we have recalibrated all of it. And if we're going to be smart about how we think about what's taking place within this demographic of Muslims, we cannot just put things in buckets and say, this is happening here. We have to understand the texture of what's happening. So I think a lot of those themes are echoed in civil society uh, in Iran. I have not gone firsthand to, to meet with these people, but, um, but I think it's a really important um, question you're asking. OK. Um, so I thought we were going to talk about social media in the Muslim world. Uh, OK, the two questions are very big questions, and I don't think I can do justice to them in such a short time, so I'll try and address them as best I can. Uh, on the issue of Bahrain, uh, I think there's a big misconception that people think that media organizations are there to cause revolutions and not report on revolutions. Our job is to report what's happening on the ground, and if something's happening, we'll report it. We're not going to go there and stir the pot. Um, we have a responsibility as a media organization to be truthful and show what's happening, and we do that. Uh, there's other misconception that people think we should be everywhere. We, you know, we can cover every single story. We have limited resources, limited amount of staff. You have 24 hours in a news day. We're covering the entire globe. We have 71 bureaus around the world. So we cannot focus on every single story. We need to see what matters most of what's happening on any given news day, and that's how we'll cover it. Um, on the issue of Syria, um, you know, Syria is a really complex story. It's you know, over 60,000 dead, almost a million refugees. It's been going on for almost two years now. Um, it's a lot more complex than the other stories. There's a lot of different factors at play in this story. And I think that to watch our full coverage, you get a full picture. I think we're the only media organization that's still giving so much attention to Syria because it is very important to the rest of the region. And I think what happens in Syria impacts, has a big impact across the entire Arab world compared to other countries that may not have such a big impact. And that's how you'd probably weight the stories. Um, so, you know, I think Qatar, we are state funded. Um, but we're not state-owned in that sense. Uh, we are independent media organization. We have our own editorial board, and we have our own um, editorial policies of how we want to implement that. Um, you visited us, and you've seen how diverse our staff yeah. are. I think it's over 60 different nationalities. Um, some of the top journalists in the world. Uh, I think for the last three years, we've won News Channel of the Year. We've picked up the RTS Award for the Bahrain documentary. We've won Emmy Awards. Um, so we are a mainstream media organization as anyone else is. In the same way BBC gets its funding from you know, the, the British government, it's, it's just an issue of funding that's there. Um, but when you get into the newsroom, when you get into our planning sessions, you have people from such diverse backgrounds. There's such an intense debate. And what makes it to screen is often taking all of these different opinions in and then informing the public um, with facts. So if you go and you watch our output, we are giving you facts. We're not giving you opinion. And I think that's the difference to other uh, mainstream networks. And then you can judge for yourself from there and make up your mind. Um, on the issue of the Arab Spring, um, <laughs> if I knew the answer to this, um, you know, I think if anyone knew the answer to this, it would be a lot simpler. Um, you're right, I don't like the term Arab Spring. I think Arab Awakening is probably a lot better than Arab Spring. Um, Where is it going? I think that the biggest challenge we have is people expect revolutions for some reason, which I have no idea why, to happen in 18 days or in a year. You know, and by people tweeting about it. Revolutions don't happen that way. Um, when new governments come in, they have, first of all, to deal with all the public perceptions that are there. They need to create a structure in an environment where they were oppressed for a long time, don't have those structures. They need to pick up the mess from the last 40 years of dictatorship that was there. Um, the reason people were protesting on the street was because they didn't have access to food. They didn't have you know, basic necessities. Uh, talking about you know, the financial system, you need to deal with the average person on the street and get, make sure their needs are uh, met. So it's a lot more complex, and it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to take time. And to think the first government that comes in is going to get it right immediately, anyone who thinks that, uh, you know, uh, you guys are here at Fletcher, and I'm sure you understand it a lot better through studying the politics behind it. Um, so it's going to take time. And you're going to see different versions of government. But what the Arab world needs right now are people who are going to come together and start discussing these issues and start coming up with tangible issues, bringing the voices on the street from the people protesting and bring them part of the conversation. And I think that's the, the missing factor right now. Um, looking across Egypt and with the rise of the Islamists across the Arab world, um, what's happening is you have your secular voices who are very strong. They're very articulate in English. They have access to mainstream media. And they are given a very big picture of what they believe should be happening in terms of governance. 
But when it actually comes down to votes and what's happening on the street or the government structures, the people on the street have a different opinion. They're voting differently. They have access to different information. This is why language is important to really understand what's happening there. If you're only going to follow the English language, you're only going to be getting one side of the view, not the entire other side, which often is the majority of the population and what they want. Um, but at the same time, it's also important for them to not just be appeasing to uh, Western, the Western world saying, this is what's wrong in my society. Offer solutions. And if you offer a better solution to what's there and present it to the public, the public will vote it for you. Don't just sit on the outside and scream and shout, oh, this is failing, this is wrong. I think, you know, after uh, Mursi came in, after the first few uh, hundred days, people are saying, oh, he hasn't fixed the economy yet, look what he's done. Really? You think he's going to fix the economy in 100 days? You know what I mean? And these, these are the, the nuances which people need to start thinking about it. And I think sitting far away from it, it's easy to sit back and criticize and say where things are going wrong and where things should need to be changed. Um, living in the Middle East and being there for a while, um, I'm South African and going through apartheid ending, forming a new government and how you go, it takes time. South Africa today is still, you know, to a large extent a mess. The political party is still figuring it out and we're way beyond anything else. And all these outside voices and all these conversations aren't helping what's happening, not just in Egypt, but across the other countries. Um, and I think that the trends of where that's going to, um, I think you touched on that earlier, and I think it's the youth are the ones who are empowered now, and the youth have a voice. And people in power need to understand that, and they need to start embracing the youth, and bring the youth in part of the solutions. Bring them to the table and include them in the conversation, because if they don't do that, they're going to go out into the streets and keep on protesting. They need to be part of the solution and not be seen on the outskirts. And that's happening across. You know, you asked about Iran, um, and I don't even think it's just Iran. Look at Spain. Look into the U.S. from Occupy Wall Street. Look across everywhere. These are issues that are happening across the world where the youth are disenfranchised. They feel that people are speaking on my behalf. You know, my life is completely different to what you are telling me as people in power. You need to come to the table. You need to realize that things have changed. And the youth now have a voice. They have a platform. They have the ability to go out. They have the ability to mobilize and have their voices heard. And the longer people keep on trying to stifle that and not bring them into the conversation, you're going to see the Arab Spring or Arab Winter, whatever you want to call it, spreading beyond the Arab world, spreading to other countries. But it's a global youth movement who now are ready to have their voices heard and say the world that we live in is very different to the world that you're trying to get us to live in. And how do we change that? How do we make a better world? And I think that ties in with your mission. <laughs> what, what, can, I just, can I just piggyback on that? Because I don't think it's you will see. I think you are seeing. Um, and, I, and I think, I mean, I think about this guy named Dido, in, um, who I met at a TEDx event last two weeks ago in, uh, in Kampala. And this guy um, was, is from Burundi. Uh, and he began to understand the power of flash mobs. And he created the first flash mob uh, in Burundi to fight against HIV AIDS. He was not going to wait for his government. He was not going to wait for someone else. He understood a tool. He said, I can go do this. I think about the, the effect of the, the, the trailer that was made in California, the, the viral thing that happened across the world, and in fact, the pushback against being violent um, by regular young people around the world who said, no, we're not going to let this guy in California define our religion or who we are, and we're going to go out there. In the UK, a campaign was started called uh, Inspired by Muhammad that showed Im images that pushed back against the, the narrative that was shown up in that film. I also think back to, uh, to I don't know if you remember, when... Um, an MP in, uh, in Denmark, uh, in, excuse me, in the Netherlands called Geert Wilders was going to make a film called Fitna. He was going to burn uh, the Quran. He made a threat. And so for months, all of us, governments all over the world were freaking out because we didn't know how we were going to react to this. Do you know what ended up happening? Viral campaign was launched by young people in, in the Netherlands who said, Geert Wilders wants us to react badly. And so what we're going to do is we're not going to, and we're going to do something else. And they launched a campaign called the Hug Wilders campaign. And it was a viral campaign that went like this, poor Geert Wilders. His mother did not love him very much, <laughs> which is why he doesn't have any love. Let's give him some love. So it was a heart hug Wilders campaign. And it was sent email to email to email that, that picked up steam, and there were, no, you know, there were no riots. So it is the innovation, it's the creative, cre creativity of your generation that whether it's flash mobs or it's an SMS campaign or it's, it's uh, Instagram photographs or whatever it happens to be, they're taking their own power, they're using their own voices, and they're making a difference. Thank you, that's, that's fabulous. I, I want to come in with, with just one point before we conclude, which is, Riyad, you made a very for me, very interesting observation that you saw the social media coming, becoming more like the broadcast media. 
and, and, and you saw it becoming, moving into silos rather than communicating across that. Do you also see counter trends? Do you see more innovation in, 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 in terms of, of, of particularly cross-cultural and cross-community communication using these, the, these media? Are, are, are there things that we should really be watching for? I think um, Farah just touched on some examples of some of the counter trends. Mm. Um, it's younger people who have access to the creativity who are trying to counter that narrative. Mm. Um, there is that movement that's emerging. It's small, but it's moving in a, in a positive direction. But it's not related to the platform or social media. It's related to a consciousness and how people are using technology effectively. Um, and I think the biggest danger we have is we just focus on the technology, focus on the issue and how you can tell the story. We are the connected generation and we'll do it in a connected way. Um, technology will have to mold itself around the needs of the people. Uh, people shouldn't mold themselves around the technology. And I think that's the trend that needs to happen. It is starting to happen. Um, it, it'll take time. You know, it's not going to happen overnight. I think the Kony video is probably a good example of an attempt where it was going wrong, but people then checked back. You know, people then came back and said, hang on, you know, there's, there's something that's not right here. It's still one of the most watched videos on YouTube. Um, we, and the counter narrative, what we did at that point was at Al Jazeera, we launched a program called Uganda Speaks. We teamed up with local um, radio stations in Uganda. Uh, we had an SMS line set up where people from Uganda could SMS uh, text in their responses. What do the, you think about the Kony video? What do you think about Joseph Kony? We then mapped that out and showed what people within Uganda thought about it versus people from the outside who are trying to tell us what to think about it. And when you have those two conversations, it's very powerful. You know, and that's where the power is when you're showing both sides and you're having those voices on the ground. Again, it wasn't social media, it was via text message, something simple as that. That then moved on to a campaign where youth in Uganda launched a website called Uganda Speaks, where even the president of Uganda had recorded a video about the topic, taking our hashtag and the branding that we did. They took that ownership and went off it with themselves to control their own narrative. And the whole philosophy behind that was it's time for Africans to start speaking, speaking for themselves enough of everyone speaking for us, we need to tell our own story. Um, so those movements are emerging and they, need to, they will become the new mainstream. Can I just Last say that Uganda, for those of you who don't know, has the youngest population in the world. Um, so the, the youth that we're talking about between the ages of 15 and 24 are really, really powerful in terms of the numbers, um, which is really remarkable. And the other data point, which really freaks me out, but many of you probably already know, um, that you know, four-fifths of the planet has a cell phone. And so when you're talking about the SMS campaigns that are taking place, you don't have to have some fancy campaign that's happening, you know, that you think, oh, you need to have, you just need a really, a phone, you know, to make a difference. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much to our, our, our two special guests. That was, that, that was really terrific. And, and <laughs> thank you. I really appreciate it.